Well, I've got the nod. Um, let me just point out that uh, when one talks about uh, South Africa, I understand we're in a slow economic environment. I know that we're in a very, uh, let's put it that, a very severe downturn, might not be a recession. I understand the average person in South Africa is getting poorer. I understand that. And I'm not going to deny that. That's not my role tonight. It's just that I looked at stuff over the years from the general household survey <coughs> um, to AMPS <coughs> to home sales to car sales to whatever you want. And I picked up that there's something else going on. And I've written about it a few times, but the last time it seems to have gone a little bit more viral than usual, which was quite good. And I got a call or two from people like the Free Market Foundation, the president, and obviously people think it's political and everything like that. And I could go on and on and on. But I'll just say, I'm going to tell you a story that I think is based on, or I know is based on fact. And it just says something else that we don't think of every day. It doesn't take away a recession. It won't take away a downgrade if it happens. None of those sort of things is what is going to play a role uh, with the stuff that we have. And you'll see why. So I'm going to quickly look at the world, because I don't think we always understand where we are today. <coughs> Just a very quick look. Then our total South African assets, which I get from the South African <coughs> Reserve Bank. And although I've got them nominally, you can see there, I'll give you the per capita in real GDP terms, or real terms, sorry, houses, pensions, some other assets, and then just a thought on income. If you look, these two things have disappeared now because they're not, no longer the same um, yearly base, but they are really similar here towards the end. And we're about $8,000 if you take the, the five years back for the... Uh, f inflation purposes and the world has become richer it really has become a heck of a richer place we don't think about it every day but just think of this on um, uh, Valentine's Day 1886 and I know this by heart because I say it in most of my presentations <laughs> all right we had a patent for a telephone and that was 14 years before the turn of that century and by the turn of the century in 1900, there was approximately about 100,000 telephones out there. And then where we are now, there are more phones than people. In fact, now we're talking of the internet things. You know, my fridge phoned you last night. <laughs> Had a cold conversation with you. <laughs> but the ultimate thing is that we don't think of, is we don't think what all this stuff has done to us. Because we must really get our minds around this. We live longer, specifically women. Women used to die in 1900 in childbirth. So they, you were a spinster at the age of 21 because you were not expected to live past the age of 33. Men also live longer, but today women live much longer than men or a few years longer. And that is a very, very different proposition altogether where we are. We have a lot in assets worldwide. We have pension funds today that didn't even exist in those days. We can travel by car. The bicycles actually are rideable today. You know, if you put it that way. And we fly around on planes. We do business every day with the rest of the world. We don't realize this. And yes, before the First World War, Exports as a percentage of GDP reached a peak of 13.5% of the then GDP. Before the Great Recession, we reached about 25% of GDP. So that's a huge thing. And that's just the exports of goods. Now we're seeing the exports of services, tourism. Tourism didn't really exist. So we're looking at a very, very different thing. If you look in the last 20 years, then people say, but that's the rich who are getting richer. Yes. It is the rich that are getting richer. Sure. Yeah. They're about 60% richer, those fucking bastards. <laughs> they should all be shot immediately. And the really poor 
the Somali pirate who lost the trip, who forgot his boat, okay, is really, really poor. But the guys that did the best are the guys in the middle. Those people in China, in Southeast Asia, who've come up, the Indians over here. Yes, the decline of the middle class in America is bringing, and, and, and in the first world, is bringing a large a lot of problems. Do you know what you say to somebody with a Harvard MBA these days? Can I have that with chips, please? <laughs> because so many people have degrees. Okay? So many people have post Quali uh, post tertiary uh, qualifications these days that people that are in the doctorate thing stay there forever and a day and they get paid a pittance at universities. And they get seven people on average. The average academic article is re read by seven people because there's so many of them. It goes nowhere. Okay? If it was a free market uh, sort of situation where they had to sell this stuff, they would be eating dirt. Okay? But think about it. This is a very different era. Over here is the factory worker, more seriously, who now supports Donald Trump or a Brexit or something like that. And he's unhappy because these guys have made the stuff that he used to make and they make it cheaper and better better capital that they put in there. And yes, some of it is cheating, like we see now in the steel markets. There's no doubt that the Chinese are subsidized to the nth degree by the local councils and by cheap interest rates and whatever you have. Electricity and the like. But a lot of people have risen out. I'm not going to talk about that. The percentage of people earning over $10, international dollars, chain weighted, GDP, sort of type stuff and purchase power parity and everything like that has risen from about 25% to 37% of the world's population in 25 years. That's a lot of people. And this is a dollar that's maybe about five or six dollars. It's not the sort of dollar that you're thinking of in, in terms of fourteen dollars and so on. So in South Africa that's about 47 Rand at that stage. Um, so you, you understand where we are. And this is that same research that I showed you two slides ago, just showing you what the average growth is being outpaced by the typical person, the median, the guy in the middle. So the average, you can say, is pulled up by the rich people. Well, maybe not. Because the median, the typical guy, is growing quicker than the average in many of these time periods. Um, you can see here it goes till 2011. So it's a very interesting thing. The Gini coefficient of the world is becoming flatter, but within countries it's becoming more because of that competition that you see. So that's where we're living in. So let's have a look at what South Africa looks like. Well, first of all, our GDP per capita did increase. There's no doubt about that. But did we increase as quickly as the rest of the world? Then no. We used to be about 13% or so richer than the rest, or 17% uh, richer than the rest of the world. And now we're about 13% poorer than the rest of the world. And it's likely to open that gap because we know that the forecasts for this year and for next year are really, really poor. The economists in the room will tell you it's not looking good for the next few years. And we're growing our population at 1.7 or 1.8. We've got to wait for the latest population numbers um, of Statistics South Africa to give us that estimate. But nonetheless, we have become richer. We've also seen an increase in the amount of people with tertiary education, by far the best, secondary completed. Doesn't mean most people have completed secondary yet, but it's been a big shift. And those with no schooling and less than primary and primary completed have become very much less. And this is not about the quality of the system or anything like that. That's just what's happening. So there's a few things on our side that should help us in the longer run as well. And now I'm going to talk about what I wrote about and why I am here. And I'm going to take it all together in one little slide here. And that's our balance sheet of households. And 
you can see our total assets have really increased. Our net wealth has also really, really increased. And this is uh, with inflation, unfortunately. But my point here is just our total liabilities are far, far smaller than our total assets. And this is from the South African Reserve Bank. <coughs> and therefore, we haven't increased this because of a credit boom so much as people think. And I'll show you just now on the household side. Here's our net wealth. And this is the net wealth without cars, without cell phones. This is just our pension funds, our houses, our things that we put into property funds, our bonds, our savings in the bank. So you can see how that's increased. And if you take the last few, we were going down all the time. So in around 1999, 2000, we were at $90,000 uh, $90, or lower than that. In fact, we were just on the 80. Now we're at 170, near 170, uh, 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 not dollars, rands. Sorry, rands. Okay, <laughs> I'm getting rich all of a sudden here. I'm making you all rich. <laughs> See, you just need to listen to an economist. I can make you rich overnight. <laughs> make you believe you have dollars. <laughs> but look, ultimately, that's the net wealth. That's after you've taken away the liabilities of people. In other words, the debt they have. And what you have here, therefore, is that people have become richer. And we don't always see that or hear that. And these are not my figures. They come from the Reserve Bank. So I decided, let's have a look how we become richer. And I'll start with this. We don't even add this. But this is a place in Sunin. It was taken by a person, this picture, uh, who worked for Safkol, Kamati Land. Uh, used to work there. Um, but they were wondering why. The timber sales didn't decline with sort of 55% because we saw in the big recession that we had in 2008 and 2009 that the sales had declined quite dramatically, but their sales only declined 30%. So they thought mm, about half that and they weren't there very long. And so they went to find out where they would went and it went along and they saw Ferreras and they saw Cashbuild and they saw all these guys. and these guys were selling it in rural areas, and these things don't come onto our building statistics. You can ask Peter Lobsher there. This is in a rural area. This is traditional land. This is a traditional hut, Tuscany style. <laughs> okay. This one in front here, they estimate to be at least 691 square meters. So we're not talking, and you can see there's two, three stories and a little bit of something on top. I'm not sure. If, so but you can see, and this is a lake in Sanin. Has anybody driven in Toyando? And, and when you go to the Northern Gates um, in Sun? Huh? Bafuri. Bafuri, yeah, Kruger Park. That's a huge area that where there's houses on big tracts of land, hey? Quite a lot of them. And uh, that whole area has got uh, uh, on the way there from um, Louis Trichardt or whatever. You go there and there's now burning of buses and people don't want to be here and so on. Sure, but there's a lot. And then you go Bushbuck Ridge. Do you realize Bushbuck Ridge is about 40 kilometers long? Yeah. And the houses look like this again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's on traditional land, so we don't measure it. But anyway, in 2013, 66%, in 2014 was a bit less, in 2015 as well. Um, but of South African home ownership, because our, our, our population of households is growing quicker than our population. So they live in their own homes. But 12% live in these sort of traditional homes on traditional land. Nakandla is on traditional land. It doesn't belong to our president. He's only got occupational rights. He said so in Parliament. Permission to occupy, PTO. Remember that? So there's different form of home ownership as well in South Africa. Yes, 14, 15% of our population do live in shacks. There's no doubt that that is a problem. But the majority stay in formal housing. Sometimes that formal housing is a Flacton Hillbrow, I agree. Sometimes that formal housing is an RDP house. But, oh, didn't want this here. Anyway, I'll get to this now. This is some. 
we have one of the most amazing development stories to tell. And it's not just um, the 78% now with the community, when I wrote this just the day after, or two days after the community survey came out, which now says that 79 point something percent of people stay in 2016 March in formal housing. But we do live there and we find that. But the fact of the matter is the number of formal houses has gone up from 8.6 million to 12.6 million in a short period of time from um, 2002 to 2013. So you wonder how that happened. Well, there's certainly been, we know, an increase of about 4 million formal sector houses. We can see that. We know that um, a few of them were built by the private sector in the big cities. We know a few of them were built for RDP purposes or RDP houses. But there's a heck of a lot of others that were self-built. How does Bushbuck Ridge, which you can see on Google Maps, you can go and look at it in Google Maps. How does that come there? But we don't have housing plans for it. We don't have housing permission there. We don't have any way to measure the number of houses. So this is important. And the Free Market Foundation, for example, wants to give people title deeds. Can you imagine how many people, if they get title deeds, would have access to a huge amount of cash, including the president? He could pay off his bond immediately. <laughs> he wouldn't have a problem. Then last week, a um, journalist called Alma Klopper, who does property stuff for Sarko 24, which is the Afrikaans uh, business stuff, she sent me a report and I put some stuff on it. But they say, the Reserve Bank says we've got about 2.4 trillion in houses. These guys say we've got 3 trillion, we've gone to 3.9 trillion. Okay? They say 6.1 million private residential houses are on the property, the deeds register. Some sorting out needs to be done on some of these things still. RDP houses are not counted and it excludes farms as well. So when it, if it excludes farms, I would take it in many of those rural areas where the guys have got those places like I showed you. They may not be there. I'm not sure though. And undeveloped urban land zone for development remained unchanged at about a half a trillion. Okay? The informal housing was not valued. We all know what De Santo says about that, that there's a wealth of stuff in the informal market as well. When you go in Cape Town in the airport, the informal market guy has got a TV dish. He's got electricity. There is some value in that. It might not be the 500 or a million uh, sort of rand category, but it could be a 30 or 40 or a 50 million, a thousand uh, rand category. As I said, SARS estimates that. But here's the rub of it. Everybody says to me, but we've only got that because of debt. Well, according to the South African Reserve Bank at the end of last year, the debt on our mortgage bonds was only 862 billion. And I then rounded it off to 0.9 Peter. Uh, that hasn't been growing in recent years, 2% a year. Nowhere near to inflation. So even on the South African Reserve Bank, the mortgage, uh, the, 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 mortga uh, the, the, the houses are two and a half times the value of the mortgages. On the other guys, it'll be 4.3 times the mortgage value. So uh, that article that you read somewhere by some foreign guy who stated to you, oh, wait, what? Piketty. No, 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 Piketty is, 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 I'm saying some guy that was trying to drive up our chances of having a housing bu uh, bubble. Piketty, we, we, we're all scared of Piketty in South Africa because if he finds out the value of our houses and our assets, we're in serious shit. <laughs> okay? But this is a, a huge story. And um, just think, we built 4 million RDP houses. Now, some people say, well, we only built 3 million and the other million are uh, the right. They gave the materials and everything, but that's fine. More than a million private sector houses have to be added in that, and that's only in the cities. And we have one of the highest home ownership rates in the world. We really do. We have higher home ownership rate than the French. 
That's why Piketty shouldn't find out about us. <laughs> There's a few other things, but I'll take you back to the... I'll, I'll do shopping malls right at the end. Um, but here's another thing that Piketty shouldn't know about us. 30% of South Africans state they have a second home. Oh my God, those flippin' socialists are actually capitalists. Because only 4% of Europe has a second home. If Piketty finds out about that, he's leaving the ANC immediately. Okay? And then the people say, but these are small houses. I don't know what the size of the second house always is, but if you look at the general household survey, 6.5 million of the 15 million people, households in South Africa, stay in houses, formal sector houses, with six or more rooms. This, while our average family size has come down from 4.7 to 3.4. So the next time you hear that the guy's looking after so many people, it's because his brother hasn't got a job. And his brother hasn't got a job and he's married and he's living somewhere else. And he ain't sending him money anyway. Alright? This is the thing. So we've come from a situation in South Africa, which I could say by rule of thumb, it's not a precise academic thing, but where we've gone from close to two people per room to two rooms per person. So it's a very different situation. Let's look at our pension fund assets. I love this. The, it, was in the ma it was in the financial mail and they said it came from The Economist. I immediately rang the Pearson Group and told them it's over. It's now mine. Uh, they laughed at me. But ultimately, here's the story. In a sense of GDP per capita, South Africa has the six highest pension fund assets in the world. The six highest pension fund assets in the world. We forget that Europe, the guy waits for the state to pay him a pension. He expects somebody else to do that. Whereas in South Africa and other more English-speaking countries or Anglo-Saxon type countries, Namibia is eighth, by the way, this is the sort of thing, and we certainly have some Dutch heritage because they have the highest in the world. And if you measure those assets, it becomes sort of the eighth highest in dollar terms, in US dollar terms. Why would we have inward listings from overseas firms? Why would somebody be able to buy up uh, a, a lot of other places? Uh, uh, SAB, for example, was able to buy a lot of other brewers, a lot of the funding they also had here to start off with. Yes, then they went to London and got more funding. Yes, now they're leaving, in a sense, but they always stayed, and the guys that are buying them are staying here. We have inward investments of property funds these days from England. And why are we different? Why is a local rating, not just the overseas or the foreign currency rating, so important in South Africa is because we can finance a lot of our own debt. <coughs> if the government, however, blows up, it'll blow up our whole pension system. But you know what's the strangest thing? We don't always realize this. And the way that we do it, we don't think normally. We really don't. And these figures, by the way, come from the OECD. I updated them in one year, that's all. So it's not stuff that Mike Schussler dreamt out. It's stuff that he saw on his spreadsheet when he was boring. Okay, so here's a fact. Look at AMCU, when they took those wages up and they said, well, if this mine fails, well, heck, <laughs> we'll just buy it with our pension assets. That was Mr. Joseph said. Matundra, am I right? Uh, you want to be both the HR department and the owners? Now, that doesn't sound like trade union to me anymore. See, I think in South Africa we get these things mixed up. We really, really do. And yes, we have only 3% of the pension fund assets that the United States has. But think about it, we have twice that of Denmark and Mexico. We have six times the value of the Swedish pension funds. Yeah. Yeah. 
all pension funds. It's called private pensions when it's paid to you. Okay, so it's it's X grants. Sorry, what percentage of the pension funds is owned by the PIC? About 20%. Mm -hmm. Then, then presumably you exclude state provided pensions. That's only from private industry. This is what is invested. Yeah. This is what's invested on our stock market, in foreign funds, it's invested in our bond market. It's nothing to do with uh, so yeah, it's nothing to do with grants. That's called a grant. Yeah, that, that, that's out of interest, Mike. Uh, in terms of the what you just said that Amco said mm. if you let go of these mines, you can buy them. And what is it that is stopping us from using your bank to establish a state bank? Well, why would I want a state bank? We already own the banks. Our pension funds own the banks. The banks are ours. But we make money out of them in savers. We pay money to them when we uh, borrow money. And our pension funds are, are shareholders in the banks. Why would I want this, the, 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 the state to compete against me? But if you look at it in terms of control, there's, there's absolutely no control for us. But APSA is controlled by Barclays. Standard Bank is controlled in, where in, in China. Yeah, I think Barclays is pulling out, and I think, I uh, don't know what the shareholding percentage is, but it's 20 or 30 percent, as far as I know, for Next Standard. Is UK. Uh, look, I mean, we, we, we've got our own banks. We, we say we, it, it's what we have. It's, we have uh, how much we control of uh, Nedbank or. Um, what's the other one? FMB and RMB and Investec and Capitec. Um, and so you might have the relationship between the graph you've just shown, the previous one and the one before that. Was that per capita? The, 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 no, it was per GDP. Asset funds, total assets GDP. to GDP. And this one was total size of the nest. Yeah, in dollars. So if we say we now know houses are widespread, we don't always know how widespread pensions are. We don't always know who the people on the pension. We've just had an argument between the pension uh, <coughs> regulator, R Roland Hunter, who's saying to the FSB, but you've closed some of these funds. So we don't always know how many people, 100%. But on their website, about 15.25 million pension accounts exist in South Africa, and about half a million what they call friendly society accounts, which is sometimes like a bargaining council that puts up some of the money away for a worker, and they call it that. And we know that about 810,000, maybe now 830, are receiving a private pension. Those 15 million pension accounts, I believe, to be just under 10 million. I think they're somewhere between about 8 and 10 million. Uh, people, roughly speaking, that we're talking about. <coughs> so if you look at it as a percentage of adults, it's about a quarter of the adult population, because that seems to be just over a, a quarter of the people in that sort of age category, but it's also difficult because some people can go on pension at 55. Tax statistics indicate, and we know that tax statistics are only a part because many people do not have to fill in a tax form. At this moment in time, you do not have to fill in a tax form if you, I think it's under 250,000. Um, and if you just have a pension with your current employer and a medical aid there, you don't have to fill it in. They do everything for you. But we know from that, uh, without that data, um, it was 120, 000, that over 7 million people, of the 7 million, 4.5 million were taking off a pension, the people that are employed. So that says to you something's happening. There's also um, three and a half million accounts that are unclaimed. That's part of that uh, 15. Uh, that could also be unclaimed. Just give me a minute, because I, I think, can we ask the questions at the end? This is going to get very hair-raising otherwise. And if you look at the 3.5 million people, uh, here on our people accounts, it is people who worked for one firm, went to another firm, and that pension is not yet claimed. It will be claimed when the person gets older or whatever the case may be. And there are also deferred pension accounts where somebody has a pension, but they've been retrenched, 
they haven't got another place, but it, they cannot be paid a pension because they're not 55 yet. So there's all these sort of things that's just giving you an idea. If you look at savings in the count, much of this comes from uh, the Labor Force Server and or AMPS. AMPS um, in 2013 gave us um, 16 million people had said that when they worked it out that they had savings in the bank. Nine million people there said that it's a bit different to the other one, uh, but it's still a high number, own home. Um, and remember that was uh, when the numbers were still a bit smaller. About five million people had a pension fund. Uh, retirement fund and about 1.6 million people had an RA. The difference being this is normally within the firm and this is somebody who's doing. Then you have life cover, unit trusts, 800,000 people said they had a unit trust. Um, investments in the stock exchange directly and invested in the stock exchange. I think the difference is that some of the people that are invested in the stock exchange have got um, uh, from the firm themselves. They've got and if you look at this, that's the other thing. You know, if you look at black economic empowerment, employee uh, share option schemes and stuff like that, I've worked with people where I've seen some companies, and I'm not going to mention names, but they in the agricultural side in this case is about 5,000 people that have got that. We know that Sassel, for example, I think is about 80 or 120,000 people. DSTV has a, ha, has a, uh, a thing and that's where the, these guys on the alternative exchange are hoping to make some of their money by taking the people from uh, uh, making it cheaper for uh, the, bl the, the, the investors in the black economic empowerment space to invest their money or not invest but trade their shares cheaper. Um, so if we look at that, it's very difficult to say what that number is. I've looked at it very hard. There are some uh, BE firms that say, well, we represent 2 million people. But it's impossible to prove. And you're quite sure that it's blown out of all contention. So I'm not going to 100% uh, be able to give you that number, but we've just got to remember that is there too. So in South Africa, we have people who are invested in the firm. Say you're working at RMB, you're invested in the firm as an employee. You have uh, a share option, you have a pension fund, and then you become part of a black economic uh, consortium in another firm. So you're three times a shareholder, if you wish. So these are the things that we don't always think about. So when Piketty comes here next, we must just inform him we want to, him to meet some of our new shareholders in South Africa and he must tell them everything that he hates about shareholders. Um, so if we look at just some other assets here, um, this is also wrong, sorry, uh, yeah, well let's just go with other assets now. Um, we don't always think about it, I wrote this in the article, so this is straight from the but all of these are mainly from the um, general household survey. But if you look back to 2002, it turns out there were 6.5 million stoves, either electric or gas. So we're not talking paraffin or anything. We're talking electric or gas stoves. And now we have over 13.2 million households with that. That, that is a virtual doubling of, of, of the stuff in your kitchen. Um, 13 million households say they have a, a TV. Um, according to DSTV, there's over 5 million people in South Africa with a satellite TV. That then means that there's more people today that have a satellite TV than there were total TVs in 1996. Um, households connected to the electricity grid, we all know that this is a good news story. And there are many figures, it's not just the household service, but you can go to the uh, ESCOM annual reports and uh, also look at the non-financial censuses of the municipalities. It's quite clear that, you know, if you look at the consumer units uh, connected, it's even over that amount. It's a, about 10.8. And, and consumer units, we must just be careful with because it's also little shops. But sometimes it's a whole block of flats. So if you look at the sort of consumer unit connected, it's about 10.8 million on the municipal side and about 5.5 million on the ESCOM side at present. Um, and ESCOM are struggling to find people to connect to the grid in the big cities at the moment. It is not easy because they are, everybody is now sort of connected. And it's a, there will still be people who aren't, like when you go home tonight, your electricity will be cut. I've made sure. If we just look at the total number of vehicles in South Africa, this is the total. So there's a 370 odd thousand trucks, uh, but they haven't climbed quite as quickly. But you can see we were about 
Um, I wrote it down here, 131 vehicles per thousand population in 1995. And now we're about 197. So that's also quite a, a big increase in the amount of vehicles uh, that people have. So we can put virtually everybody, if we can fit five people to a vehicle, some of them are buses and mini taxis, uh, we will fit in the whole population and can get them mobile if we want to, okay? So if we look at some other indicators, again from AMPS, so this is not a government figure, but if you look at this, and I used this at a Red Bull, and they had a seminar, and there was quite a lot of interesting people there. But we were at 40%. We're in the lower LSMs, 1 to 3 in 2001. Now we're looking at that being only 10%. So that is somebody that's typically rural, doesn't have access to certain things, would only have maybe a cell phone, not even a smartphone maybe of a cell phone type of thing. And then you go up here, and this is the big one that's changed, and this the, the one 7 to, to, to 10 changed a heck of a lot. And if you look at 10, um, but look at that, some 17 to 31, um, that's actually 7 to 9 there. That's nearly a doubling of that part. And that means by that stage, the person has not just a stove. I would guess that the stoves are already at LSM 4 to 6, but they have a television, they have a hi-fi, they have a sitting room, they have a, a, a fridge, they have a heck of a lot of conveniences when you get to those sort of ca categories. So this is no longer a, 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 a can be described as a poor population. I, I really think in asset terms we are not poor. And um, I'm going to talk about the credit just now and I'm going to get to something else. But before we do that, there's something else that happened. And that is when we had um, that little mall over here, that Mall of Africa. You realize that this is an amazing story and that about 250,000 people visited it on its first weekend. That's right. Remember all the traffic jams? That's more than all the political parties in South Africa had at their manifesto launches combined. <laughs> So, if you want to win this country, go for shopping. Hmm? Have a shopping party. Shop till you drop party, we will make you spend. Alright? So, ultimately, that is the one thing. And then Dr. Prince was saying that we had the sixth highest space in the, in the world that, were, uh, that malls covered. And I went to, and I disbelieved this and I went to the World Shopping Center site. And this thing, data on two malls of over 2,000 square feet, it's an American site. And this is uh, all the stuff that we're doing here is Bissern. But we don't have the population that some of these people have. So we have the six highest malls space in the world. If you then divide it per capita, feet space, we're in third space. If you take the U EU 27 as one. Some of them might beat us, but I don't think many. The Norway is also part of the EU27. They're the highest there. So they were taken out. The Asians, the Turkish, and the Latin American six. We shop. And if I were to talk to you about the employed in South Africa, and I were to compare just the adults that are employed, which we know is only four out of every ten, we'd be in second place, just behind the Americans. And if you think that these malls are not making money, your pensions are paying you money out of it because there is some sort of return to these big firms that are doing the mall development in South Africa. Yes, some of them are branched out because there's not too many malls. But I mean, just yesterday, there was a, a tornado in Tembisa. Am I right? Yeah. And what did it hit? A mall! <laughs> because we've got so many of them to hit for tornadoes! <laughs> Okay, that's what we have. We have too many malls. It's a fact. All right? So, if you think of that, broad unemployment of 36%, but we have one of the highest amount of malls in the world. And I mean, these malls work on food traffic. And they work on sales. And they all have places that sell you vegetables and groceries and bread and so on. And that's not typically the thing that just the rich buy. Am I right? Yeah. 
Somebody's making that stuff successful. It's not that everybody buys the same amount. And it just starts becoming a little bit unbelievable. Everything is just doesn't make sense anymore. In my mind, there's a lot of good news stories to tell. So I'm quickly going to go to over here. So again, people tell you, but it was all financed by debt. Yes, to a large extent, there was a big credit boom. Went from 55% or below that of our income to 85% uh, is what we owed. We've brought it down now. And it's on its way down to about 75%, roughly speaking. So the last few years weren't a credit boom. The credit has become more short-term in nature. A few years ago, circa 10 years ago, you can see where we were. Uh, we were in the middle of that credit boom, but we were below the other countries. Denmark, by the way, I always said then, had a similar national credit regulator type of law that we did. And you can see where they went to with their debt to disposable income. So we're not there yet, okay? Then I looked at credit active consumers, and this is the surprising number. The credit active consumers in South Africa are 23 million. But only 15 and a half million people work. Some of them for free. Some of them for only an hour a month. That's what we're told. And since 2014, the banks have had to do these checks quite a lot harsher than they did before. And yet the numbers continue to cry, climb. And you are not, these are not the small credit providers that have got less than 100 people. They don't have to report here yet. All right. So these are the bigger ones. And they are not going to get these sort of numbers. And they're based on IDs. If the person is getting a child grant because you cannot give debt to anybody that gets less than 800 rand a month and also the banks go to the risk department of banks and tell them that you're 70 years old and you'd like a loan try to get a loan at 70 in fact try to get a housing loan at 59 try it you can't because they look at it differently they might still give you a car loan, but they're not going to give you a car loan at 70. Well, not a big one anyway, maybe 20,000 or 30,000 rand, and they can see what your pension is. But this says something else is going on here. This is not explained by the Labor Force Survey. This is not explained by many other things. And if you go and look at this, the working age population that is credit active is now getting close to two thirds, yet only four out of 10 people work. And many of the people that are work say they're working poor and therefore they still need the child grant. Yes, it's fine. Your domestic worker may get a child grant because she's only being paid two and a half thousand rand a month and you're allowed to get a child grant still if you earn three or four thousand rand a month and all that type of stuff. That's true. So something else is going on here something very very different and that's all I'm saying that's why would people when you've got when you're looking after other people's money well with banks we never know but when you look supposing you're looking after other people's money you should be checking the people that you giving credit to that they have some form of income I would sincerely hope so because otherwise we'd have a lot of delinquents and this is the other thing, the number of credit card, uh, uh, the number of um, accounts per credit active consumer has flattened out at about three and a half. So that says to me, people have quite a bit of accounts out there. The impaired credit records have come down. Yes, there was a, a, a bit of a, 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 a forgiveness thing, but it hasn't really after that climbed dramatically. And... Uh, it's less than 50% of impaired. Impa impaired records is not somebody that doesn't pay completely. It's people who are two months or more behind. And <coughs> remember as well that we're not even talking about people with accounts with municipalities here because they don't have to report this. So we, we're only talking about people who've actually taken out a loan uh, at, a, at a loan shark or a bank or something like that.
or a, a, a retailer as well. So the credit active consumers in the last eight years have increased with 38%. The number of credit accounts has increased with nearly 60%. Um, yes, the, the arrears are up, but you know, if we look at the whole thing, then if we look at the, 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 the um, non-farm uh, formal sector where we would think most of these credit accounts would be, it's about 30% of people work in the formal sector. But double that amount of people are getting a loan from the bank. So I'm just wondering how that works. I don't have all the answers. I'm just saying maybe our income is not so on. And then the latest, that's now a year old, the latest one should come out soon, but says that the average person or the typical person in South Africa earns 3,120 Rand. And in the formal sector, it's about four and a half thousand Rand, the median wage. But how come when we have three out of 10 adults working in the formal sector, so the maximum they'll be out of households would be three out of every 10 households. How come we have three out of every 10 households who have a car? Because a car, even a second hand car or a third hand car is going to cost you more than a third of that, four and a half thousand rand. So think about that. It might be different. But also what was interesting is 37% of all public uh, servants stated they earned less than 4,500 Rand, which is absolute bullshit. <laughs> all right. And um, uh, further 9% said they earned between 4,500 and 6 when the minimum wage was about 5,500. So you get the clear idea that there's some, also the, it turns out that the, that the South African state is a slave uh, driver and they are uh, traders and slaves because about 5% of their people don't get paid. And you know, so obviously if you're working as the president in the country, you don't have to get paid. Um, you might just get paid in houses or whatever, no, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, wives and so on. Um, but the, the, the state increased its salary bill so much and we've now got data from actuaries and everything that this is well uh, uh, over 1% above the rate of inflation, 1.8% above the rate of inflation for the last 15 years, plus a notch increase that most of them get of 1%. Um, so it's been a huge, huge, huge. Um, so I think the salary data is corrupt. And I think if you just use what I've been using here, I mean you can use the SARS data as a further one. You can use the credit uh, counselors data, debt counselors data that gives you a similar story. But you can see here, if you look at the median of the uh, national credit regulator, you get to 8,000 versus the 3,120. And maybe, I'm not saying this is 100% academically correct or anything, maybe this explains part of the assets that we have. The pension fund assets, the household assets that we have, the, the houses we have, all that type of stuff. Yes, there's also been a success story where government built RDP houses. People have taken those RDP houses, especially if they give them transfer in their title deed and they improve them and they build checks and they rent out that as an extra income. There's certainly some of that going on. There's a lot of other stories, but I'm nearly finished. I'll just say this. I think if we look at South Africa today, we don't get the full story if you just look at one side of the, 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 the accounting of South Africa, if you want. If you look at the balance sheet, then we've got a lot of assets. People are very quick to say, I have a car, I have a cell phone, I have a, a hi-fi, I have a house, I have a pension. But when you go and you ask them, what is your income? Hey, I'm very poor. So I'm just wondering if there's not something else going on here that people may say they're very poor to receive an extra grant or something like that. That might be one motivation. Or because they're scared of crime or whatever the case may be. Because if some stranger comes and asks you, what is your income? Are you really honestly going to tell him the honest story? So I think that's where we have this differentiation. And if you don't believe the surveys, you just have to sit in a traffic jam one day for an hour on the way back from the airport. And you realize that there's a lot of cars around you and it can't be just one person driving all these cars. And you realize that there's a whole different thing and that traffic jam doesn't only happen in up here, it happens in Cape Town, it happens in Durban. I've sat in a traffic jam in Bloemfontein or Mangaung. So 
you see traffic jams, and that must mean some form of asset wealth. You look at the houses around you, you look at, you drive through a Bushbuck Ridge or a Toyando, you drive to the northwest and you drive through certain places where certainly people have built illegally on the Val Dam, but you drive for a kilometer or two of people just having little houses there, and it becomes quite obvious that we have a lot more than we care to mention. Thank you very much.